Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. A judge denies former President Trump's motion to shift his so-called hush money trial from Manhattan, where Trump's lawyers say a majority of residents already believe Trump is guilty. We have the latest on Trump's legal cases. Details of a proposed hostage ceasefire deal emerge in the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. warns Israel against a full-scale military operation in Gaza's crowded city of Rafah as Israel's prime minister declares a date has been set. President Biden unveiling a new plan to cancel student loan debt. That's less than a year after the Supreme Court struck down his first try to fulfill a campaign promise. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell gets behind an effort to force the divestment of TikTok. He's demanding Congress take action, calling the app a threat to national security. West Virginia restricts state business with four financial firms due to their alleged boycott of the fossil fuel industry. It's the latest in the ongoing ESG dispute. A total solar eclipse brought temporary darkness to millions across the country. NTD's Chris Beers has the report from Syracuse, New York. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Welcome. Today is Tuesday, April 9th. Yeah, and court records show that Trump is actually suing the judge in his criminal case in New York to challenge that gag order. Right. Pretty unusual move. Also essentially an appeal in the form of a lawsuit. Yeah, and some media are saying that it's a long shot, long shot especially because it's so close to the trial. And this case is topping the news this morning as a New York appeals court judge rejected former President Trump's request to delay his so-called hush money criminal trial. Here's more on the story. A lawyer for Trump said his client was seeking to delay the case while an application to move the trial from Manhattan to Staten Island was being heard. The lawyer questioned the fairness of jury selection in Manhattan due to start next week. He argued that Trump would face prejudice from jurors in the left-leaning borough. He cited a survey taken by Trump's legal team that found 61 percent of respondents in Manhattan already thought Trump was guilty and 70 percent have a negative opinion of him. The judge on Monday denied the motion. A lawyer from the Manhattan DA's office countered that Trump waited too long to object to being tried in Manhattan and argued biased jurors can be weeded out during jury selection. Trump's lawyer said they are also challenging a gag order. Judge Juan Mershon earlier barred Trump from publicly discussing witnesses, as well as court staff and their families. The appeals court judge did not rule on the gag order on Monday. Any ruling on the gag order will likely not impact the timing of the trial. Trump is accused of covering up his former lawyer Michael Cohen's $130,000 payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels in exchange for her silence before the 2016 election. Daniels said she had an affair with Trump a decade earlier. Trump has denied any such encounter and any wrongdoing in the case. In Trump's federal election case, special counsel Jack Smith is urging Supreme Court justices to reject Trump's bid for presidential immunity. The case is due to be argued on April 25th. Trump says he has immunity from criminal prosecution for any actions taken in official capacity as president. A lower court rejected Trump's request for immunity in December. He's now appealing the decision at the nation's top court. Smith argued the effective functioning of the presidency does not require that former president be immune from accountability. In August 2023, Smith brought four federal criminal counts against Trump, including conspiring to defraud the United States and obstructing the certification of President Biden's victory. In Georgia, Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis urged the court to reject any challenge to her involvement in Trump's election case in the state. Trump's lawyers earlier tried to get her dismissed, arguing she had a financially beneficial affair with the case's lead prosecutor and misused public funds. The judge ultimately ruled to remove lead prosecutor Nathan Wade, but keep on Willis. The defendants sought a review of the decision. The appeals court has more than a month to accept or review the decision. Former President Trump says he believes abortion laws should be left to the states. In a social media video yesterday, the former president also stressed there should be exceptions where abortion is allowed. And today's Arlene Richards has the story. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights. On Monday, former President Trump gave his official view on abortion in a four and a half minute video. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, 
The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. The Republican presidential candidate said he supported exceptions for rape, incest, and to protect the life of the mother. He had previously hinted he could support a 15-week federal ban with those exceptions. In this video, he didn't say at what stage he thought it would be appropriate to ban abortions, but he did give his stance on late-term abortions. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is, the baby is born, the baby is executed after birth, is unacceptable. He also reiterated that he supports the availability of in vitro fertilization. Yet there's pushback from at least one of his supporters. Top Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who endorsed Trump's 2024 bid, said in a statement on X, I respectfully disagree with President Trump's statement that abortion is a state's rights issue. A prominent anti-abortion group said they were disappointed. Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, said in a statement, We are deeply disappointed in President Trump's position. Unborn children and their mothers deserve national protections and national advocacy from the brutality of the abortion industry. Many Republicans supported Trump's stance, such as House Representatives Greg Murphy, Scott Perry, and Nancy Mace, each agreeing that abortion should be left for the states to decide. Marlene Richards, NTD News. Here for some analysis of Trump's stance on abortion is Sean Carney, the president and CEO of 40 Days for Life. Sean, it's good to have you here. How does Trump's abortion stance here, allowing states to make this decision, affect his campaign leading into the general election? Well, I think it's smart. I mean, overall, Trump, like most Republicans, has really botched abortion since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But this is a way better move than his 15 week abortion ban, which no pro-life person that I know supported. And so, um, you know, unless you're going to ban all abortions, as we know, life begins at conception or you're going to do a national heartbeat law. I don't really know what everybody wanted him to do. The worst thing that he could have done was a 15 week ban. But we know whether he does a 15-week ban, a 39-week ban, a six-week ban, he's not going to win over uh, any Democrats or abortion supporters uh, based on this issue. Abortion is now a top six issue uh, for Democrats. And so the shelf life for the knee-jerk reaction after Roe it is starting to, to rot. That said, Sean, why would Trump take the stance of leaving the decision to the states? because that's what the Supreme Court did. We didn't vote on abortion in 1973. They gave us abortion and then they corrected their error in 2022 and it was at the hands of, of Donald Trump. And so the way that they overturned Roe, it does hand it back to the states and Trump is, is leaving it at that. And since the overturning of Roe, 23 states have passed pro-life laws, whereas seven states have passed pro-abortion laws. And so it, it's not a losing battle. It is about hearts and minds. Eventually, I do think we'll have to uh, uh, recognize the 14th Amendment in all human life. But the country obviously is not there yet. And the worst thing he could have done was a 15 week ban, which is only one percent of all abortions. You mentioned that Trump's going to have a hard time winning over Democrat support here on this abortion issue. Let me quote former President Trump. You must follow your hearts on this issue. But remember, you must also win elections to restore our culture and, in fact, save our country. Is there a hint of politics in this decision? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the politicians always say that when they talk about winning elections or strategy, everybody knows a compromise is, is on its way. Uh, I don't think you need to follow your heart on this. I think you need to follow the science. We don't believe that life begins at conception in 2024. We know that it does. Medical textbooks state uh, that it does. And so we've lived in the schizophrenia of when we're comfortable with the baby dying. Is it 15 weeks? Is it 24 weeks? And right now with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, it has gone back uh, to the states. And I think he was smart to highlight how insane uh, some on the left are at wanting abortion and infanticide as places like Texas and Tennessee and Florida and Alabama wrap themselves in glory by by protecting all human life. Okay, Sean, is Trump targeting a certain voting demographic with his position on abortion? Yeah, ironically, I know he's getting criticized, but the reality is a 15 week ban would have hurt pro-life voter turnout. I was very worried about that uh, for him. 
Uh, I, there's no pro-life person that thinks that that was reasonable. And it's because the baby can feel pain, you know, as if now we're in a mercy killing because it's at 12 weeks like Europe. I, I just, I don't think that was a good position at all. I think he felt like maybe he needed to do something and he really doesn't at this time. He did so much. He's the most pro-life president ever. It got sent back to the States. It's going to the states. It will eventually, over time, be a political national issue. Uh, but right now, uh, there's just not a whole lot that I think can be accomplished. And and the the irony is that no pro-life person in 2015 thought that Donald Trump was going to be the one to help overturn Roe. Well, it's really good having your input on this issue, Sean Carney, President and CEO of 40 Days for Life. Thank you. The Department of Justice has refused House Republicans' request for President Biden's recorded audio interviews from his classified records probe. An assistant attorney general said all information sought from a congressional subpoena had already been provided, including certain transcribed interviews. Special counsel Robert Hur said Biden cooperated with his investigation and decided not to charge him for taking classified documents after leaving the vice presidency in 2017. Her said a jury would likely not convict Biden, who would present himself as an elderly man with poor memory. House Oversight Chair James Comer reacted, pledging continued efforts from House panels to get the information. Comer stated Americans demand transparency from leaders, not obstruction. He promised a response to the D Justice Department soon. House Republicans have threatened to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt if the department does not hand over all the records they seek. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and the Philippines this week. The allies seek to boost economic and defense ties to offset China's growing power in the region. Biden's bilateral summit with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Wednesday will bring an upgrade in defense ties with Japan. On Thursday, Kishida will become the second Japanese leader to address a joint meeting of Congress. His predecessor, Shinzo Abe, gave a speech in 2015. Biden will also hold a meeting with Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos on Thursday. Last year, Marcos and Biden joined Kishida for a trilateral summit that focused on the South China Sea. Other issues on the agenda include managing risks from North Korea and the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. An update in the Israel-Hamas war, CIA Director Bill Burns made a new U.S. proposal for a hostage and ceasefire deal in Cairo over the weekend. Negotiations with leaders of the U.S., Israel, Qatar and Egypt have been going on for months. The U.S. proposal reportedly calls for the exchange of more Palestinian prisoners than previous negotiations. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is warning Israel about its planned military offensive in the crowded city of Rafah as Israel's prime minister declares a date for an operation is set. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has the latest on negotiations. An anonymous diplomat and other sources told multiple outlets the U.S. proposal made in Cairo over the weekend calls for the exchange of 900 Palestinian prisoners, many with life sentences. In past negotiations, the number was around 700. Hamas would have to release around 40 hostages in the first phase of a three-stage, six-week ceasefire deal. The anonymous diplomat said the U.S. proposal asks that civilians sheltering in the south be given unrestricted access back into northern Gaza. He said Israel insists on security inspections for people moving north, a sticking point in talks. Mediators have been trying for months to broker a deal. A Qatari representative told the BBC he was optimistic on the state of talks. Without giving details, he said the proposal bridges the gap, but was far from the last stretch of talks. An Egyptian state media citing a senior Egyptian source said Hamas and Qatar delegations left Cairo Monday after all parties agreed on basic points to return in two days to agree on terms of a final agreement. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said Monday he was up to date on negotiations and declared he'd set a date to send troops into Rafah. Today I received a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals, primarily the release of all our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. This victory requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller says the U.S. has told Israel it believes a full-scale operation in Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on civilians and ultimately hurt Israel's security. So we have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. 
Around 1.4 million Palestinians are sheltering in the border city with Egypt. Miller says over 300 aid trucks entered Gaza on Sunday, the highest number in a single day since the war began. He says the daily number needs to continue to grow and be sustained. Our hope is that by later this week, 350 trucks will enter Gaza each day, and we are working hard across the United States government to make that happen. We also welcome the announcement by the, that the IDF is establishing a coordination unit, unit for deconfliction as a direct contact point with the humanitarian community. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says over 33,000 Gazans have died since the war started. It doesn't differentiate combatants. The terrorist group took over 250 hostages in its October 7th attack. Officials say roughly 130 remain captive and believe around 100 to still be alive. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Coming up, Senator Mitch McConnell says it's urgent for Congress to take one of the Chinese Communist Party's favorite espionage tools off the table. The Senate Minority Leader now backing bipartisan efforts to force the divestment of TikTok, calling it a threat to national security. And some House Republicans are urging Speaker Johnson to bring up a $95 billion Ukraine aid bill after weeks of stalling. Accusations of Russian interference are starting to fly. President Biden unveiling a new plan to cancel student loan debt. That's less than a year after the Supreme Court struck down his first try to fulfill a campaign promise. shining gem of New England. This delightful seaside city of Newport is one of the most beautiful places in the state. Today we bring you here as we meet with our friends and fellow musicians from the Hermitage Piano Trio. As a team they have garnered multiple Grammy Award nominations with their breathtaking performances. Wow, I did not think this instrument can make that sound. Or... <laughs> the pandemic made this reunion even more special. Three of us, we like it because we feel music the same way, so... Don't miss us on the next episode of Piano Talks. Say goodbye to harsh, bitter coffee and hello to a delicious, smooth brew. With specialty quality beans expertly roasted in-house, you'll taste the difference with every sip. Fermented with a blend of 50 enzymes, Day's Coffee delivers a rich brew like no other. Made with the highest grade specialty beans available, you're sure to taste the difference. Elevate your morning with Day's Enzyme Fermented Coffee. You're not gonna get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat.
Welcome back. President Biden has announced a new plan to offer student debt relief to millions of Americans. This follows the Supreme Court blocking a similar attempt last year. Let's get some insight into President Biden's push for student loan forgiveness from Richard Stern, the director of the Federal Budget Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks for being with us, Richard, and I'm sure you have a lot to say on the financial aspect of this, but let's look at this from the lens of politics. Is Biden's announcement for new student loan relief an election tactic for votes? Oh, I think it very clearly is. I mean, I, you know, you were just talking about it a second ago in the monologue there, right? But this comes right in the middle of the election when he's trailing in the polls. The Supreme Court has already said that what he is doing is illegal for the president to do, that the president can't just wave a magic wand and dissolve these assets owned by U.S. taxpayers. So, yes, I think this looks very, very nakedly like shameless vote buying using federal taxpayer dollars to do it. This has been criticized as a transfer of wealth. And if I point back to a political opinion in 2022, they're showing that this is a politically savvy move and it's giving the relief to not the poorest, not the neediest of Americans, but those who are college educated. And a lot of those who were benefiting at that time were ones with graduate degrees, JDs. They're very well off in the financial sphere here. Is this geared towards winning over the younger population? Well, so at the time, this kind of worked like that political sleight of hand because inflation was low, interest rates were low. So for the people that got the, quote, benefit from this, you didn't see the cost of it. The cost was associated, you know, kind of across the economy. Today, a lot of people, most Americans, and certainly the group you're talking about, they're facing steep in uh, interest rates on mortgages, on credit card debts. If they're in business, they, they employ themselves. If they have a small business. They see very high rates on on business growth so what's happening right now is you know biden's going to people saying hey i'm going to forgive some debt for people that as you said are well off that that actually a lot of them already apply uh, um, are able to get a student loan forgiveness and don't even apply for it but what does that come at the expense of even higher mortgage rates for people trying to buy a home get into the middle class even higher rates for small businesses to get money to expand their operations or pay their workers, even higher credit card rates. We're at peak levels of credit card debt right now. So, you know, the kind of people that might see this as, as a bribe and might want to vote for him are also going to look at it and say, wait a second, this just means that rates are going to skyrocket on everything else I need to borrow money for. That's so, a very important. Personally, I don't think the American public was easily fooled now. I think they see the interest and inflation ramifications of this kind of action. That's a very important, important point there, Richard. And one thing that can't be ignored is the base of the Democratic Party, which is college educated. Biden's proposals for canceling student debt trace back to the summer of 2022, as we mentioned. That was before the war in Gaza, obviously. But his new plan to relieve borrowers' debt, is it a strategy to make up for some of those lost votes of the Arab Americans that are protesting his support for Israel? So, in my opinion, to the extent that this is a political thing, it's grasping at straws, right? I think that what people care about, what people want, is real principled action. And that's on both sides of the aisle. You know, one of the things I've been proud to do with the Heritage Foundation is we fight for conservative causes. We fight for conservative principles. We don't chase politics. We don't chase votes. We're a nonpartisan organization. What we chase are principles. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. So anyone who's taking a course of action that feels unprincipled, that feels like it's choosing winners and losers. It's not going to work. That's my opinion. Okay, just in a few seconds here, Richard, what are the financial ramifications of this? So at a, at a mechanical level, this ev eviscerates taxpayer assets, which means that it reduces interest income to the government, increasing the deficit. And so that's what's happening right now is you're getting rid of the debt for a handful of people, increasing federal debt, which means increasing interest payments that everyone else pays for, making the government suck more of the financial oxygen out of the room, meaning there's less money to borrow. So again, if you're trying to borrow money for a mortgage, credit cards, small businesses, your interest rates are higher. So that's how this wealth transfer works. And it's hitting most Americans and all of the small businesses that employ so many Americans. Richard Stern at the Heritage Foundation, thank you for your analysis. Thank you as always for having me on. 
Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is backing efforts to force TikTok's divestment from its Chinese regime-linked parent company. The Republican leader says it's urgent that a bill is passed to take one of Beijing's favorite tools of espionage off the table. McConnell says TikTok is a national security threat with an algorithm that pours gasoline on alarming trends. He pledged his support for common sense bipartisan steps. The House voted overwhelmingly last month to give TikTok's owner ByteDance about six months to divest its U.S. assets or face a ban in U.S. app stores. Other bills are being floated in the Senate that would address the Chinese-owned app, including one from Senator Josh Hawley for an outright ban. Hawley welcomed McConnell's support, but said he thinks the chances are less than 50-50 that a strong bill would make it to a vote. Senator Hawley says... His bill to ban the app sends a message to communist China that Congress cannot be bought. And there is a growing call from Republicans in Congress to pass billions of dollars in aid for Ukraine. House Speaker Mike Johnson has so far given no indication of any plans to vote on President Biden's $95 billion request. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued a public letter to Johnson yesterday, urging him to bring up the bill in the House. The bill passed in the Senate with 70 percent of the vote, but it's been stalled for weeks in the House. Some Republicans have made claims of foreign interference. They accuse opponents to Ukraine aid of being influenced by Russian propaganda. Among them, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Michael McCall and House Intelligence Committee Chair Mike Turner. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, meanwhile, says Ukraine will lose the war if the U.S. does not approve military aid. And a congressional inquiry found Coast Guard leadership illegally used non-disclosure agreements to prevent sexual abuse victims from reporting alleged abuse. The inquiry focused on sexual misconduct at the prestigious Coast Guard Academy, Texas Senator Ted Cruz is a ranking member of the committee that looked into the Coast Guard's actions. He spoke out about the findings in a letter to, to the head of the Coast Guard, Admiral Linda Fagan. He said the use of ND, NDAs appeared to be part of a years-long effort to hide information about sexual assault at the academy. The Coast Guard said the agreements previously signed were not meant to silence victims. A statement said the NDAs were used to protect the integrity of the investigation and protect vit victims' and witnesses' privacy. And a major policy change in college women's sports. The National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics yesterday banned men who identify as women from competing in women's sports. The NAIA represents mostly smaller colleges with around 83,000 athletes at 250 schools. The NCAA has around 500,000 athletes at over 1,000 member schools. The new policy says only female student athletes may participate in its women's sports events. Any eligible athlete may participate in men's sports. The vote by the Association's Council of Presidents was 20 to 0. Women's rights activists like Riley Gaines are calling on the NCAA to follow suit. Virginia's Lieutenant Governor Winsome Earl Sears wrote, Common sense prevails today. It's more than time for the NCAA to do the same. Just ahead, a Taiwanese microchip manufacturer gets a major windfall from the Biden administration. More on the company's U.S. plans. And the impeachment trial of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is set to start this week. We have the timeline. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Lord Heavenly Father, I pray to you today to guide us tomorrow. Give us strength as 
we face death, help us not to be afraid, as we know that we are going to be coming to your people. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting. And there's chaos all around and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her, and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time, and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. It was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from, I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the, steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic and for a lot of people right now the whole world is very very chaotic so I guess that's another reason why so many people are very drawn to this. When I was growing up, my mom was extremely tidy. We were trained to put things back where we got them from. One day, when I walked into my mom's house, I felt like I walked to someone else's house. There was stuff everywhere. And just growing up, the way I grew up, and to see this transition was very alarming. When Sean talked to me, it was a wake-up call, and that's when I went to the doctor. Welcome back. The Biden administration pledged yesterday to provide up to $6.6 billion to a Taiwanese semiconductor giant. The funding would be used for the company to expand the facilities it's already building in Arizona. It would also better ensure the most advanced microchips are produced domestically for the first time. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said the funding for Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing means the company can expand its existing plants <clears throat> excuse me, for two facilities in Phoenix and add a third newly announced production site. Raimondo says the chips are key for artificial intelligence and called them vital to the 21st century military and national security apparatus. The funding is tied to a 2022 law designed to revive U.S. semiconductor manufacturing. The law aims to minimize the kind of chip supply disruptions that occurred in 2021 after the start of the COVID pandemic. The Senate is set to pick up the impeachment case against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas this week. Here's a timeline. The articles of impeachment will be presented to the Senate on Wednesday. That's when the trial officially begins. House impeachment managers will act as prosecutors against Mayorkas. Senators are scheduled to be sworn in as jurors on Thursday. Mayorkas faces two articles of impeachment. The first article charges him with refusal to comply with the law. The second accuses him of breach of public trust for allegedly lying to Congress and saying the border was secure. It's estimated that over 10 million illegal immigrants crossed the border under the Biden administration. The Democrat-controlled Senate is widely expected to dismiss the impeachment trial against Mayorkas. And on the border crisis, a fresh disaster on a grand scale. That's what experts are warning is going to visit the food supply due to mass illegal immigration. Dr. Michael Victor Vickers, a veterinarian who served on the Texas Animal Health Commission, made that prediction. I spoke to Darlene Sanchez, a reporter for the Epic Times, who spoke with that expert and recently visited the Darien Gap Migrant Pass to learn more about this. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Well, what's happening is with mass migration, um, you know, there's been uh, approximately 9 million um, illegal immigrants come across our southern border. And part of the problem is whenever you overwhelm the border like that, 
the checks and balances that would normally occur do not occur. For example, a, um, a former Border Patrol agent said basically the uh, health checks, all those amount to is they raise up their shirts and look to see if they see anything that like a skin disease or something and ask them if they're pregnant or not. And that's it. So any of the health screenings that would normally take place, like they would test them. For example, if you're coming from a foreign country and you apply to come over here, you have to, you know, fill out these forms and you have to, you know, say what your vaccinations have been, et cetera. So what is this tuberculosis that we're seeing coming across the border and can it be transmitted from humans to animals? And is that causing the problem? Yes, that is a, definitely a big problem. So, um, the illegal immigrants that are coming over right now, um, many of them have um, antibiotic resistant uh, tuberculosis. And what that means is that, you know, they're carrying it, it may be kind of dormant in their system, but they don't even realize it uh, in some situations because they might have taken antibiotics that didn't really kill it um, in their native countries. So some of these uh, tuberculosis strains are zoonotic, meaning they can pass between human and mammal. And that's exactly what happened in Texas in two different situations already where illegal migrants pass these on to dairy herds. One dairy herd of around 10,000 uh, dairy cattle had to be uh, destroyed because the, the disease was so rampant in, in the entire herd. They couldn't save it. Yeah, that is a very serious challenge that they're dealing with down there. And that border security advocate and former Border Patrol agent that you mentioned was saying that there's multiple diseases that some of these migrants can be carrying and they're just not even checking for them. What's happening in Central America with this screw worm resurgence? Yes, one of these um, situations that they're, they're focusing on or looking at, keeping an eye on at least, is in Central America. What happens is a lot of these migrants have come through the Darien Gap. Uh, from South America uh, coming into Central America and then, of course, on to the United States. Well, you know, they're they're thinking this may not be a coincidence because for the first time in, you know, a quarter of a century, there's a new outbreak of screw worms in Central America, uh, Panama area, Costa Rica. And what's happening is they they've tried to stop it. And uh, they've declared an emergency because they're having a lot of trouble with that. And these screw worms, their larvae are actually maggots that bury into the skin and eat their, um, their hosts alive. I know that sounds very gruesome, but that's exactly what they do. And they can eat humans as well. So are they attaching to people's bodies as they migrate and then going on to animals once they get here? They... It can definitely be transmitted by humans if, if, you know, one of these flies lands on an open wound on a human and lays eggs that can be carried that way and passed on to other cattle or humans. And then the animals themselves, you know, that some cattle, of course, is brought into the United States. They have to be very careful about that as well. So there's a double concern with that. Yes, they can hitch a ride on even suitcases and luggage, things like that. Darlene Sanchez, reporter at the Epic Times, thank you so much for shining a light on this. Thank you. Elon Musk is entering a legal battle with Brazil's most influential Supreme Court justice. Musk says he's defying court orders to censor certain accounts. Because of that, the high court is now investigating him for alleged obstruction of justice. And today's Arian Pastar is in Brazil with the details. Brazil's Supreme Court wants X, formerly known as Twitter, to suspend certain popular accounts. Now, Elon Musk says that the court doesn't allow him to publish the names of the accounts that are supposed to be suspended. And he says that he doesn't actually know why they should be suspended. All we do know is that this is part of the court's investigation into former President Jair Bolsonaro. Now, because of these aggressive demands, Elon Musk now says that Brazil is slowly becoming a dictatorship. I asked the people here in Brazil to see if they share the same concerns. I totally agree with Elon Musk. This is how Venezuela started. We know that it's dangerous to have communists in the government. Venezuelans are fleeing to Brazil. Where can we go to? Argentina? The ocean? There's nowhere to go. I don't agree with Elon Musk, not at all. Brazil is a full democracy and all rights are being guaranteed. Brazil's Supreme Court has been investigating alleged misinformation used to overturn the 2022 presidential election. This started after January 8, 2023, when people breached government buildings in the country's capital. 
similar to what happened on January 6 in the U.S. Musk says we do not know which posts are alleged to violate the law. We are prohibited from saying which court or judge issued the order or on what grounds. Despite not being allowed to talk about it, Musk later said that the person behind the order was Supreme Court Justice Alexandre de Moraes. Musk says that de Moraes wants him to suspend the accounts of sitting members of parliament and that he threatened to arrest our employees and cut off access to X in Brazil. Lastly, the entrepreneur says that X will publish everything demanded by Alexandre de Moraes and how those requests violate Brazilian law. This judge has brazenly and repeatedly betrayed the constitution and people of Brazil. He should resign or be impeached. Musk also says that such government overreach could take place in the US too in the future. De Moraes has not responded to the comments. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. Stay with us. West Virginia restricted state business with four financial firms due to their alleged boycott of the fossil fuel industry. The latest in the ongoing ESG dispute coming up. What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to smileactives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always choosing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away. A performance that truly matters. For each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. Shen Hyun. Coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at ShenYun.com. If you're buzzed and doing this, to make yourself feel okay to drive, ZWX. Not okay to drive. Y G K L B W. Uh, regular you. Good to have you back. Joining us now is NTD's Business Matters host Don Ma to give us the latest updates from the financial world. Don, tell us about cars. Okay, yeah. So Tesla apparently has settled a high-profile case here, um, and this was has to do with their electric cars and its controversial automated uh, driving system. Um, well, controversial uh, in the sense that uh, we're just talking about it, uh, because 
Uh, yesterday, uh, terms of uh, settlement was uh, announced, uh, not too much details, but it seems like uh, the, uh, they're settling a case involving a crash and death involving a person who used their automated driving feature. So let me just tell you about that. Uh, jury was originally uh, to begin yesterday, but it didn't because of the settlement. Um, and the suit was filed by the family, of course, of the former Apple engineer who died. Uh, he died after his Tesla Model X crashed while the autopilot feature was engaged and the trial could have lasted several weeks. But the parties settles, settled and Walter Huang, uh, he was killed when uh, his Tesla struck a concrete highway median in Silicon Valley in 2018. The National Transportation Safety Board's investigation found that autopilot was engaged for nearly 19 minutes before the mm -hmm. fatal crash. Uh, when the car, which was traveling at 71 miles per hour, extremely fast here, veered off the highway. And ev ev evidence indicated that Huang was playing a video game on his iPhone uh, when the car actually crashed. Right, and I think investigation found that, found that, and that's why they found an over-reliance on the autopilot. But I remember the incredible scrutiny on Tesla's autopilot for a while there. Um, let's head over to airlines. You have an update on Spirit Airlines. What's happening there? Yeah, it seems like some cost-cutting uh, measures are being taken here. S some Spirit Airlines pilots are going to have to uh, be uh, laid off potentially uh, because uh, it's going, the airline is going to have a slow fall. Uh, it's planning to furlough about 260 pilots in, in September. It's because the airline reached a deal with Airbus to delay uh, all aircraft deliveries for the next year or so. Spirit filed an all Airbus fleet, uh, but that's only part of the problem. The other issue here is that Spirit had to ground some of its A320 neoplanes due to problems with engines made uh, by Pratt and Whitney. Uh, Wall Street reacted positively to the news because it reduced costs. Uh, of course, it's also going to slow down revenue. The, the news comes days after United announced it wants to uh, have some of its pilots take voluntary unpaid leave, uh, and that's due to similar issues of new aircraft delays. But in United case, those are coming from Boeing. Yeah, it's not too much of a surprise considering that the New York Times reports that Spirit hasn't been profitable in four years. Let's talk about ESG. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, some uh, latest developments on that front. It seems like West Virginia added four financial firms yesterday to a list of institutions that may be barred from some state business. Uh, so this is because the state's treasurer deemed uh, those companies on the list. They're boycotting the fossil fuel industry. Now, state treasurer Riley Moore said that Citigroup, HSBC Holdings, and TD Bank and the Northern Trust Company had been added to the list. Moore's office says that the list is for firms that, uh, it's a quote here, that have publicly stated that re they re will refuse, terminate, or limit doing business with coal, oil, or natural gas companies without a reasonable business purpose. So West Virginia, by the way, is a major energy producing state. Um, and so uh, it's not a surprise that they may be boycotting some companies right. here. Yeah. Hence, hence why it's so important to them. Um, let's move on. I'm interested in knowing more about the Chinese property sector because I think there's more cracks showing, would you say? Uh, apparently, it, it could be that uh, more cracks are showing because this has uh, happened happened yesterday. Uh, pressure is being put on China's property market. Um, and what that means is Shanghai-based property giant Shimao Group uh, re receiving a liquidation petition here. And that's significant because according to a filing, state-owned China Construction Bank filed a winding up petition. It claims that Shimao has failed to repay over $200 million in debt. And Shimao missed its first interest and principal payment on a billion dollar bond back in July 2022. And the company says it will vigorously oppose the petition and it adds uh, it, it plans to continue working toward reconstructing, re, uh, restructuring and maximizing value for the stakeholders. And the court's website shows that Shimao's first court date is on June 26. So yeah, some cracks showing here. That's big news. According to the BBC, a third of China's economy is its property market. So if problems in that sector hit, it could really affect the country's economy overall. Exactly. Don Ma, host of Entities Business Matters. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to break here. A total solar eclipse brought temporary darkness to millions across the country. Entities Chris Beers has the reports from Syracuse, New York when we come back.
What was the process of actually putting this all together? Many, many hours of finding the right camera angles and watching it. The first trouble started just after one o'clock. 45 pages, here it is right here. Donald Trump has been indicted. Somber day for the country. This all happened before President Trump's speech was over. The founder of the Oath Keepers Militia Group is headed to prison for more than 18 years. His lawyers didn't have this no. video. The, the video we're watching right now, his own lawyers did not no. have. There was a big question of what did the people do who actually did enter the building. This is where we picked it up with the security footage that is new. At this point, the, the story dramatically changes. The New Jersey man who assaulted a Capitol police officer on January 6th has been sentenced. So this was withheld. This was not shown to the defense. That could be considered exculpatory evidence. This doesn't seem like what a lot of the media is showing. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. What we're after is the truth. When I drink it, the first thing was it, I feel the warmth in my, in my tummy. It's kind of like it's gently radiating out, you know, a kind of a very comforting warm. And it was really good, actually. I felt uh, uh, much better. I did feel, actually, an effect. And I find that it is actually better when I take it regularly. It's actually steamed and dried nine times. And so it's really, the essence is really extracted. Then a second time, I tried it really like on an empty stomach and just just two, two teaspoons of it and over a few times. And wow, there was a big difference because suddenly I could feel, why wow, I was very good energized. I didn't have to eat. I could work outside in the garden for a couple of hours and I still felt very well. And I was impressed by that. So I think it's a good product. My mother was always very familiar with her neighborhood, but one day she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual and uh, she didn't know whether she should go forward or, or turn, and she wasn't even really sure where she was at. It was very unsettling for her. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, I don't want you to worry or be afraid. I'll be there for you, and we'll figure it out. Good to have you back, and of course, yesterday was a big day. Yeah, it was, and you know how a lot of Americans gather around the TV to watch the Super Bowl? Well, I was just seeing so many solar eclipse watch parties, people in their yards looking up at the sky, and then Incredible, even people right? at the office buildings downtown Manhattan coming out just to enjoy it. Yeah, I actually walked home during that time, and it was like the city stood still for a little bit. Yeah, it was getting pretty dark. Tens of millions of Americans witnessed a total solar eclipse yesterday, a rare occurrence when parts of North America descended into temporary darkness. And Diddy's Chris Beers was in Syracuse, New York, to catch this celestial event of a generation. On Monday, a total solar eclipse crossed through the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. A total solar eclipse happens when the moon completely blocks the light of the sun. The sky darkens as if it were dawn or dusk. Here in the U.S., the path of totality passed diagonally from Texas to Maine, but most people in the country will be able to see at least a partial eclipse from where they live. From Indianapolis to Kerrville, Texas, eclipse chasers gathered to get the clearest view of the celestial event. Syracuse, New York is one such prime viewing location just inside the path of totality. Here's what people there told us about their experience. For sure, I'm, I'm in awe. A, a definite matter, memory for us. It was pitch black at 3 o'clock in the day. I thought it was so crazy how this could happen. 
incomparable. I think it was a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, it was amazing. Very cool. <laughs> wow. It's all thanks to our EP Bio teacher who brought <laughs> us here. Yeah. The sun's out, but it's not. It's just, it was, it's just magical. I mean, obviously we were hoping the aliens would come and take us, but you know, no luck. <laughs> we're still here. It was really incredible. It was a core memory and it was an awesome experience. The program taught us a lot about researching and collecting data, not just for this, but for other things, and also taught us a lot about how the eclipse affects the climate and things like that. It particularly impressed me the darkness. Well, it was just like, might as well be 11 o'clock at night. We'll have to stick around and catch the next one right here. <laughs> 55 years from now. 55. Yeah, well, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Totality lasted up to 4 minutes and 28 seconds. The first location in continental North America that experienced totality was Mexico's Pacific Coast. The path of totality then entered the U.S. in Texas around 2.20 p.m. Eastern Time before traveling through multiple states and exiting the U.S. in Maine at around 3.40 p.m. Eastern. Weather permitting, people along the path of totality were able to see the sun's corona, or outer atmosphere, which is usually obscured by the bright light of the sun's surface. The solar eclipse prompted authorities in multiple states to issue travel warnings and severe weather alerts. One estimate says the eclipse could generate $6 billion in economic activity as hotels and businesses along the path receive an influx of visitors. Delta Airlines even provided path of totality flights for people to view the experience above the clouds. Throughout history, solar eclipses have held spiritual significance for various religions around the world. Cosmic phenomenon comes just days after a rare earthquake shook the East Coast, sparking discussion about the end times and other interpretations. The last total solar eclipse visible in the United States was in 2017. The next won't be until 2044. Reporting from Syracuse, New York, Chris Beers, NTD News. That's fun, especially the ones that came out with those tinfoil hats. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And Washington Square Park had apparently a lot of people coming out with so-called solar eclipse outfits. They were fully decked out. That's awesome. They're ready for the incoming of <laughs> <Yeah>. ET. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, we are heading to a quick break at this point, but we'll be right back. So stay with us. NTD News, the fastest growing independent news source in America bringing you breaking news from around the world. Expert analysis, investigative reporting, and original award-winning documentaries. We're known for our uncensored China coverage you won't find anywhere else. We cover the stories that affect you and shape our world without the political noise. We report from the heart with you in mind. Watch us right here on NTD News. Good morning, welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. A judge denies former President Trump's motion to shift his so-called hush money trial for Manhattan, where Trump's lawyers say a majority of residents already believe Trump is guilty. We have the latest on the Trump trials. The Justice Department rejects House panel requests for audio of President Biden's interviews from his classified documents probe. Oversight Chair James Comer reacts. President Biden is planning on wiping out more student loan debt. What you need to know and how to find out if you qualify. A farmer with the gift of gab and a lover of Japanese culture. Entity's Kelly Wright speaks in Israel with the families of hostages six months into the Israel-Hamas war. Banging pots to scare away a sun-eating native American legend and a mid-air proposal. The unique reactions and experiences of those viewing the solar eclipse yesterday across the U.S. One man finishes a run across the length of Africa, a journey that spans nearly 10,000 miles. Stay tuned to hear the story of his incredible experience. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Welcome everyone. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, and we have today's top news. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and the Philippines this week. 
The allies seek to boost economic and defense ties to offset China's growing power in the region. Biden's bilateral summit with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Wednesday will bring an upgrade in defense ties with Japan. On Thursday, Kishida will become the second Japanese leader to address a joint meeting of Congress. His predecessor Shinzo Abe gave a speech in 2015. Biden will also hold a meeting with Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos on Thursday. Last year, Marcos and Biden joined Kishida for a trilateral summit that focused on the South China Sea. Other issues on the agenda include managing risks from North Korea and the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. A lot on the table there. Absolutely. That's right. And a New York appeals court judge rejected former President Trump's request to delay his so-called hush money criminal trial. Here's more on the story. A lawyer for Trump said his client was seeking to delay the case while an application to move the trial from Manhattan to Staten Island was being heard. The lawyer questioned the fairness of jury selection in Manhattan due to start next week. The judge on Monday denied the motion. A lawyer from the Manhattan DA's office countered that Trump waited too long to object to being tried in Manhattan and argued biased jurors can be weeded out during jury selection. In Trump's federal election case, special counsel Jack Smith is urging Supreme Court justices to reject Trump's bid for presidential immunity. The case is due to be argued on April 25th. Trump says he has immunity from criminal prosecution for any actions taken in official capacity as president. A lower court rejected Trump's request for immunity in December. He's now appealing the decision at the nation's top court. Smith argued the effective functioning of the presidency does not require that former president be immune from accountability. In Georgia, Fulton County DA Fannie Willis urged the court to reject any challenge to her involvement in Trump's election case in the state. Trump's lawyers earlier tried to get her dismissed, arguing she had a financially beneficial affair with the case's lead prosecutor and misused public funds. The judge ultimately ruled to remove lead prosecutor Nathan Wade, but keep on Willis. The defendants sought a review of the decision. The appeals court has more than a month to accept or review the decision. Earlier, I spoke to Sean Carney, the president and CEO of 40 Days for Life, to get his analysis on former President Trump's stance on abortion. How does Trump's abortion stance here, allowing states to make this decision, affect his campaign leading into the general election? Well, I think it's smart. I mean, overall, Trump, like most Republicans, has really botched abortion since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But this is a way better move than his 15-week abortion ban, which no pro-life person that I know supported. And so, um, you know, unless you're going to ban all abortions, as we know, life begins at conception, or you're going to do a national heartbeat law, I don't really know what everybody wanted him to do. The worst thing that he could have done was a 15-week ban. But we know whether he does a 15-week ban, a 39-week ban, a six-week ban, he's not going to win over uh, any Democrats or abortion supporters uh, based on this issue. Abortion is now a top six issue uh, for Democrats. And so the shelf life for the knee-jerk reaction after Roe it is starting to, to rot. That said, Sean, why would Trump take the stance of leaving the decision to the states? because that's what the Supreme Court did. We didn't vote on abortion in 1973. They gave us abortion and then they corrected their error in 2022 and it was at the hands of, of Donald Trump. And so the way that they overturned Roe, it does hand it back to the states and Trump is, is leaving it at that. And since the overturning of Roe, 23 states have passed pro-life laws, whereas seven states have passed pro-abortion laws. And so it, it's not a losing battle. It is about hearts and minds. Eventually, I do think we'll have to uh, uh, recognize the 14th Amendment in all human life, but the country obviously is not there yet. And the worst thing he could have done was a 15-week ban, which is only 1% of all abortions. Well, it's really good having your input on this issue. Sean Carney, President and CEO of 40 Days for Life. Thank you. The Department of Justice has refused House Republicans' request for President Biden's recorded audio interviews from his classified records probe. An assistant attorney general said all information sought from a congressional subpoena had already been provided, including certain transcribed interviews. Special counsel Robert Hur said Biden cooperated with his investigation and decided not to charge him for taking classified documents after leaving the vice presidency in 2017. Hur said a jury would likely not convict Biden, who would present himself as an elderly man with poor memory. 
House Oversight Chair James Comer reacted, pledging continued efforts from House panels to get the information. Comer stated Americans demand transparency from leaders, not obstruction. He promised a response to the Justice Department soon. House Republicans have threatened to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt if the department does not hand over all the records they seek. The Biden administration pledged yesterday to provide up to $6.6 billion to Taiwanese semiconductor giant. The funding would be used for the company to expand the facilities it's already building in Arizona. It would also better ensure the most advanced microchips are produced domestically for the first time. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said the funding for Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing means the company can expand its existing plans for two facilities in Phoenix and add a third newly announced production site. Raimondo says the chips are key for artificial intelligence and called them vital to the 21st century military and national security apparatus. The funding is tied to a 2022 law designed to revive U.S. semiconductor manufacturing. The law aims to minimize the kind of chip supply disruptions that occurred in 2021 after the start of the COVID pandemic. And if you or a family member has student loan debt, relief might be coming your way. The Biden administration is trying to erase some of what people owe. The initiative only applies to certain borrowers, though, and it faces potential hurdles. Let's take a look at what might qualify you for loan forgiveness. Today, too many Americans, especially young people, are saddled with unsustainable debts in exchange for a college degree. President Joe Biden has a new strategy to forgive some student loan debt. The White House says it would help more than 30 million borrowers if implemented and combined with plans the administration has enacted already. Even if they get by, they still have this crushing, crushing debt. The initiative targets federal borrowers who have unpaid interest beyond a certain threshold, 20 or more years in repayment, eligibility for loan programs in which they're not enrolled, education from a so-called low financial value program, and certain hardships like medical debt. Most people should not have to carry this kind of um, worry. The new plans are more selective than Biden's previous initiative, which was for most middle and low income federal borrowers. The Supreme Court says action that broad needs to involve Congress, and many Republicans say taxpayers who didn't go to college shouldn't fund degrees for those who did. Across the board, student loan forgiveness is regressive. The new plans aren't ready for signups yet. It could take months to finalize them, and they'll likely face legal challenges. Democrats will continue exploring every option under the sun to lower costs and make college more affordable. Coming up, people still have to, held captive by Hamas, including a farmer with the gift of gab and a soccer enthusiast who loves Japanese culture. NTD's Kelly Wright is in Israel, speaking with the families of hostages six months into the Israel-Hamas war. Banging pots to scare away a sun-eating Native American legend and a mid-air proposal, the unique reactions and experiences of those viewing the solar eclipse. A man finishes his journey across the length of Africa, spanning nearly 10,000 miles. Stay tuned to hear the story of his incredible experience. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, fostering martial ethics, and reviving the true tradition. The preliminaries for the 2024 NTD International Traditional Martial Arts Competition will be held across New York, Taiwan, and Germany. The grand finals will be broadcast live online worldwide in August 2024. For more information, please call 1-888-477-9228. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music.
master classes, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. We've been spending a lot more time than ever at home these days. So maybe now you've just noticed cold air coming in from a couple windows or that your patio door isn't closing fully, which means you're losing heat in the winter, losing cooling in the summer, losing money all year long. And that means now is the time for new windows and patio doors from Renewal by Anderson. Most installations are usually done in just one day. Renewal by Anderson windows and doors can help lower your heating bills and air conditioning bills with their most energy efficient glass available. Only their windows are made with Fibrex material proven to be two times stronger than vinyl. And they're backed by a 20 year warranty. And right now, when you buy one window or patio door, get one at 40% off. Plus, there's no money down, no payments for 12 months, and no interest for 12 months. Plus, an additional $200 off your entire purchase. 1-800-968-1443. Are you ready to help your family get prepared for the unexpected? Everyone in? Here we go! Ladybug and Cat Noir know how important it is to be ready. Because you never know when Hawk Moth is going to strike, or a disaster will hit. And you don't need miraculous powers. Just put those planning skills you already have to good use. Know who to call, decide on a safe meeting location, and create an emergency preparedness kit. Make a plan that will help you and your family be ready when emergencies happen. Ready Kids can help. I'm coming to save you! Get started at ready.gov slash kids. Good to have you back. And we're continuing with our coverage of the six months mark of the Israel-Hamas war. And we have a special report. Yeah, America's Hope host Kelly Wright was recently in Israel talking to the family members of hostages and others to hear how they're coping. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more. Yair Moses is the son of Margalit and Gadi Moses, who were both kidnapped from the kibbutz near Oz on the morning of October 7th. Hamas terrorists descended on the village, murdering and kidnapping its residents. His mom, Margalit, was freed from Gaza in late November, but his dad, Gadi Moses, is still being held captive. Yair shares his message with the world. Everyone must do whatever they can in order to have the, them released. This is the most important thing, not to the, only the families, not only to Israel. It should be the number one priority for the whole world, because once these people will be back home, even the war in Gaza will stop and everything will stop and will be different. Yair says his father has been a farmer for more than 60 years now. And for the past 35 years, he has been helping people in developing countries around the world learn how to improve their agriculture. He specializes in irrigation and soil, and he loves to show them, put his hands into the, into the land and show them exactly how the water in the soil and everything. And it doesn't matter if it's a group of professors from the university or kindergarten kids, he will talk with, on their level and explain them exactly that they will understand and make sure all questions are answered that everyone was satisfied. You are proud to be his son. Of course I am. Of course no are. doubt about it, no doubt. He's an amazing you, man, amazing grandfather, amazing father, of course, and yes. And you want him home now? I want him home six months ago, but yes, yeah. Like many other family members of hostages, Yair says his life stopped on October 7th. I didn't work since October 7th. I focus only on doing activities to release them. I didn't shave, I don't wear this beard usually, I didn't cut my hair, and I'm focused only on bringing him home now. Prime Minister Netanyahu appointee Tal Gilboa's nephew is being held by Hamas. She says it's not enough to just bring the hostages home. She says Hamas must be defeated. We have to break Hamas. We don't want the Hamas will be next to our people because we can't take it anymore. Gilboa says no country would allow such an attack to happen to them. 
And everybody said, no, you have to, uh, to see that the civilians won't hurt. And you have to see that you're, you're, you're giving in, uh, enough supply and aid. We're doing all these kind of things. But we want our people in Israel to be safe. And we want the hostages back. Gilboa discusses her nephew being held hostage. Guy is so shy and very modest. He loves to play music. It's like he was born with the soccer in his hands. He loved the Japanese culture. His biggest uh, dream was to be on April in Japan and to feel the Japanese culture and the cherry blossom. The Netanyahu appointee says they are putting all their prayer and energy into Guy to bring him strength and ensure his well-being. We want him back and we want him back alive and we want all his dreams to come true. NTD's Kelly Wright has been talking to hostage families, rabbis and pastors, Jewish and Arab people. The America's Hope host has a special report on what he learned coming out in just a few weeks. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. We will have several parts of our special report to cover the Israel-Hamas war, so stay tuned for that tomorrow. Yeah, I know uh, Kelly is doing a lengthy tour throughout Israel. It's great that he's uncovering all these and exclusive stories, things that we would never know if we would not hear that, so that, you know, people like Gadi Moses and uh, Yair, they can share these stories. Yeah, their families are going to great lengths to try to bring awareness to this and do everything they can to put pressure to get their family members back home. Right, exactly, because six months later, still they're waiting on them and, you know, thousands are on the streets in solidarity to protest protest getting a um, hostage release or a deal done. And I think, yeah, it's, it's just, I hear it, there's an incredible tension because of that in the, in the country now. Yeah, but there Understandably. are, there are some road bumps definitely in the works here with yeah. Washington Post reporting that senior Hamas officials say that the temporary ceasefire talks are on hold right now. And that comes as Prime Minister Netanyahu says that they have a goal of completely finishing the job, wiping out Hamas altogether. And that involves going into Rafah. Right. And like every day, though, we want to head also to some softer news in this point, at this point. So throngs of sky watchers across North America gazed upward at a blackened sun during the midday dusk yesterday. They celebrated with cheers, music, and even matrimony for the first total solar eclipse on the continent in seven years. And today's Daniel Monahan has their reactions. Crowds gathered at a Benedictine monastery in Erie, Pennsylvania to watch the solar eclipse. The Benedictine Sisters of Erie held the viewing and offered free solar eclipse glasses for guests on the property. Sister Linda Romy called it a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It really was miraculous that the sky cleared just before the eclipse started. The moon started moving over and we got to watch the whole thing. And 11-year-old Jace Bruno was truly impressed. Just seeing like the circle around it was, I don't know how to describe it, it's just, it was so cool. Passengers aboard a Delta Airlines plane had a once in a lifetime viewing party unlike any other, riding the solar eclipse's path of totality. Taking off from Austin, Texas, the flight hovered 30,000 feet above ground, carrying a sold out cabin filled with excited eclipse enthusiasts before landing in Detroit. Weather and clouds were no factors for travelers as the eclipse entered totality in clear view through passenger windows. Absolutely amazing. The best flight I've ever taken with Delta. It was incredible. I got to see the wonderful, beautiful eclipse. I got to see the moment of totality. Well, we spent a lot of time drawing on a drawing board and coming up with our plan. And uh, we went into the simulator and uh, experimented a few times. This eclipse enthusiast used the rare event to propose to his beloved. A once in a lifetime experience, so it just seemed like perfect to combine it. In the small town of Millerton, Oklahoma, dozens of eclipse chasers watched nervously as clouds covered the skyline in the morning. But a break in clouds gave way to a stunning full total solar eclipse. During totality, people banged on pots and pans to scare away Funilusa, the black squirrel that Choctaw legend says is eating away at the sun during the eclipse. Creation itself declares there's a god, and we just saw it. In Cleveland, Ohio, cheers erupted on opening day at Progressive Field as the crowd watched the moon cover the sun. It's pretty wild. 
you know, I saw things on the news, they were talking about it being celestial and things like that. But as you experience it, it feels kind of weird like that. I thought it was kind of hokey when they were talking about it, but then as it happened, then, you know, it was kind of neat. The next total solar eclipse will occur on August 12, 2026, visible in Greenland, Iceland, Spain, Russia, and a small portion of Portugal. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Okay, I gotta hand it to that guy. Proposing during an eclipse, that's clever. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's hard to top that kind of romance up there on a flight, asking somebody to marry while you watch the solar eclipse. And for their whole marriage, if they do get married, they're gonna look back on that and they're gonna remember it. Yeah. <laughs> well, great move. I'm sure she will remember it forever. And also, we're switching topics now. A British man has just completed one of the longest runs of his life, spanning the entire length of the African continent. He overcame a wow. mountain of hurdles, including getting kidnapped by an armed gang. Here's the story. This is the moment British extreme athlete Russ Cook finished running the entire length of Africa. He started nearly a year ago in South Africa and logged his final day of running in Tunisia, on Sunday. I knew it was going to be hard, but I, was, I knew I was also going into the unknown, so I had no idea really of how hard it was going to be, but it's safe to say that it uh, surpassed all expectations. But there's obviously been a bunch of times where it was very difficult. Sahara Desert, sandstorms, and uh, you know, pushing that mileage up for the last couple of months was really tough as well. But just got to get it done, and the only way out is the end. Cook can pinpoint his toughest challenge. It wasn't being robbed at gunpoint in Angola or even being slammed by food poisoning. It was getting kidnapped in the Congo by a gang armed with machetes. The scariest moment was uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was, that was pretty nuts. In the end, Cook ran nearly 10,000 miles and made it through 16 countries. <laughs> The 27-year-old raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity and amassed a crowd of supporters who joined him for the trek's final leg. Blake Warren flew in from the U.S. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I was laying on my couch. I literally got on Skyscanner. I looked for a ticket, and 20 minutes later, I bought the ticket, and here I am. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. Cook says motivating others to get off the couch and get active is what his quest was ultimately all about. Uh, it would be awesome to get people moving more. I'm a big believer in sport. Changed my life, so I'd love, uh, love for more people to be, you know, inspired or motivated to go out, out running or taking part in any kind of sport. While enjoying a hard-earned rest is on the immediate to-do list, Cook says he isn't hanging up his running shoes just yet. I've scratched the itch for a while, but um, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if I start getting, uh, start planning some more things in the art uh, pretty soon. I have, uh, I've got a whole list of ideas. That's a brave gentleman right there, standing up to the elements and then other forces that were thwarting his attempt to Yeah, let this. alone kidnapping. And of course, he said he had food poisoning. He went through so much. And apparently, the only time, that's what he told media, he thought about quitting was when he actually got kidnapped. What a guy. <laughs> yeah, 352 days on the road. That's a real feat. They should write a book about this guy. Yeah, good idea. Apparently, he sat down and told the media, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> yeah, he needs a little rest. Well, yeah. Maybe a stretch party or two. Yeah. All right. Uh, at the, on this note, we have to wrap up our show right here. But be sure to stay tuned for NTD's News Today broadcast at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. That's coming up. And for Around the Clock original news coverage, visit us at NTD.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. The shining gem of New England. This delightful seaside city of Newport is one of 